need um, people to partner with us because um, I cannot do <laughs> do life alone. I can't um, make all the meals and be with everyone by myself. And um, we haven't gotten everyone else up to speed on cooking yet, so we don't have all of us helping to cook <laughs> together. <laughs> um, um, so, um, yeah, we're just up here to um, ask you to partner with us. Um, do you want to give a little information on when the meal is and how many people to prepare for? Um, sure. <laughs> So we normally eat around like 6, 6.30ish, um, and um, we normally have like, yeah, like 15 people or so. So at least 15 people to prepare the food for. Ooh. Ooh, yeah, what kind of food do you like? What kind? I like pizza personally. I think, <laughs> I think pizza's the best. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm not sure everyone really would love my PBJs that I would make, so <laughs> it would be helpful if we could get some meals in. Penny, penny so, what kind of desserts? Oh, penny? Oh, cookies. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to get that back. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll have this sign-up sheet over at the table there with all the other information if you want to sign up to bring a meal. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you guys, too. <laughs> They're not really picky about dessert, let's be honest. <laughs> um, I do know that, yeah. So thank you so much. Yeah, there's back there that sheet. And I, you guys have been so great at um, preparing meals for our youth. And, um, and they, I, I love it. I love the relationships that, these, these, um, that they're building together and the friendships. And it's fun as a parent to watch them grow and their relationships to grow with Allie and John. And... Um, yeah, I had a great youth pastor, and I loved and I loved them, and so I'm really thankful um, for that. Also, um, they can get their calendar. Oh, the, the November youth calendar is over there yep. too. So grab that. Um, all right, so then I'm going to go back to the in the loop. Um, the, the trunk or treat was a success again. Huge tons. We ran out of hot chocolate by like 5:30. Yep. We were out and done, and it was all gone. So I hit my head on a trunk. Oh, thanks. That's the most compassion he's gotten about that all week. I, I that. <laughs> I've got a lot of smirks. And I'm like, so tell me you're not going to shave your head now so with it. Well, it's November. It's no shave November, so maybe I'll grow my hair no? for a month. Mm -mm. Carly says I look like a q -tip. He gets a little... <laughs> no. I have a comb over. Not, that not a comb over. It just gets... It just... Q-tip is kind of the word I say for it. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for all the candy. It was a lot of fun. If you come down and see that time, it is a great, it's a great time for our town. Um, Valor meets this Tuesday at Main Street um, at 6.30 sharp. Sharp. Um, apparently, if you come late, it's awkward. I've heard. <laughs> so, Don't stop. Yeah, second Sunday prayer is next Sunday. Um, they just meet right over there in the cry room before um, service during worship practice. Um, Coat drive. We, yep. what? Oh, you got it. Um, we noticed on Facebook that um, Hair Power Sports is actually doing a coat drive this year, which we are super excited about um, and super excited for them. And as most of you know, we try really hard to not just do things just to do things, but to partner with people in our town that are doing things. Um, and so we are partnering with Hayward Power Sports. Um, we actually, they're giving out $25 gift certificates. Did you bring those? Nope. Not, nope. They're at the house. They're at our house. So, but hopefully, maybe you didn't bring your coats this week. So we'll have those. We'll have them at Main Street yep. um, for a coat drop-off, and then you will get a card. Um, it has to have, um, like, a signature. Yeah, you guys have my signature, Allie's signature, Carly's signature, Morgan's signature. You can't put your own name on it. And they need to know that you didn't just grab a stack right. of... And it's, it's <laughs> not, and it's not like you bring three coats, you get three cards. Right. So just heads up on that. So anyway, so this is a this is a provision for our town for our kiddos. I got it. Um, provide for them. So we're excited um, to partner up with them. Um, generosity box is right back there on the um, table for our tithes and offerings. Um, and yeah, I think that's all the information. Awesome. Hey, um, if you got a Bible, you want to open up to John chapter 4. John 4, we're going to be there today. Um, this is what I thought would be interesting for us to do. I've been reading this. Uh, how many of you have ever heard the story of the woman at the well, right? You ever heard the, this, the woman at the well? You ever heard that phrase? Um, so... This is what I thought we'd do. Something just a little, little different. I mean, like, I don't have, like, four points in a psalm or a poem or something like that. Um, I'm not real good at poetry, and I don't read enough of it to have one. So um, this is what I thought we would do. As I was reading this, um, 
just a lot of great things stuck out to me. And I thought, man, wouldn't it be cool if we all just sort of navigated through it today a little bit um, and just sort of talked about those things. Is that all right? Just sort of a fluid uh, kind of uh, day today, if that's all right. So um, don't worry. I won't, I won't ask you to do anything uh, unusual um, today. So maybe next time. But um, there's, there's three things I just want us to sort of, in the context as we read, three things I want us to remind ourselves of. And the first one is this, is that Jesus came to show us the Father. Right? Jesus came to show us the Father. Now, in, in John 14, verse 9, Philip is talking to Jesus, and he asks this question. He says, Jesus, show us the Father. I'm like, hey, what we really want to see is we want to see God. We want to see the Father. And Jesus replies, he says, he says, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? And I'm sure at that time, Philip's like, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the Father. <laughs> and Jesus tells him, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. He goes, how can you say, show us the Father? In other words, Jesus was saying, listen, if you've seen me, you've seen God. Like, you don't need to ask to see God. If you've seen me, you've seen him. So just make peace with that. So one of the things that we want to, and just in a reminder as we navigate through this today, is that number one is that Jesus came to show us the Father, right? The second one is this, is that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. All right? It's pretty simple stuff. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. It says in Luke 9, uh, excuse me, in John 4, uh, in Luke 19, 10, he says, For the Son of Man came to what? Seek and to save the lost. Pretty easy. So first of all, Jesus came to show us the Father. Second of all, Jesus came to show us or, or to, uh, to seek and to save the lost. And the last thing I want us to just remind ourselves of is that all Scripture is God speaking to us for our benefit. In 2 Timothy three sixteen through 17, it says, All Scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So as we read this, what I want us to just in the context and the framework is understanding just those three things. If we see Jesus, we see God. When we hear Jesus, we hear God. It's almost like sometimes I think in Scripture, what I think Philip was saying was like, Jesus, we know you. Like, what we really want to know is God. Like, you're Jesus. Like, you know, we know your mom. We know your dad. We know where you used to work. We know where you used to live. What we really want to do is we want to see God. We want to see the big man. And Jesus has to remind him that, listen, <laughs> I'm he. I'm the big man. If you've seen me and you've heard me, then guess what? You've seen and heard the Father. No need to look any further. No need to try to pick your brain hard enough to figure out the, the, the secret code to seeing God. I think sometimes we overcomplicate it, right? We make it a little too, like, muddy, right? Again, the second thing is Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He came with a purpose, and that was to bring as many people to the kingdom as he could, Right? Now, the water's deeper than that, right? But the very simplistic thing is Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And the last thing is that Scripture actually speaks to us. And it's God speaking to us. And so when we read it, we don't read it like any other book. We don't read it like a novel. We don't read it like, a, like, a, like, like an instruction manual to put together a grill. We, we read it as if God himself is speaking to us. And now as we read it, we understand that as we, as we read it and we sort of eat it, Right? One of my roommates uh, back in Bible school was a was an ex uh, drug dealer, and uh, he used to have this saying all the time. It was so quirky. I'd, I'd always just tell him, like, "Dude, don't say that anymore. It's just quirky." But he would always say, "Man, I got to get my gospel in today," and I would go, "That is the most corniest thing I've ever heard in my life." I used to think he was still doing crack when he was <laughs> saying that. But you know, I think I, I think it's got some truth to it. I think I think the more we eat it, right, the more we take it in, the more we read it, the more we make it a part of our life, the more it starts to affect who we are. So here we go, John four. I'm just gonna we're just gonna skim through one through ten. All right, just a little small chunk today. Is that okay? You guys good? All right. So just relax. It's no big deal. I won't call on anybody specific. No, I'm just kidding. Here we go. Ready? It says, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees, I'm in John 4, 1 through 10. It should be on the back. So when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he, 
he had to pass. Uh, sort of underline that had to pass because I got I, I got some issues with that. Um, had to pass through Samaria. In verse five, so he came to the town of Samaria called uh, Sychar, and near the field of Jacob. Um, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. In verse 6 he says, Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied uh, as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. And it was about the sixth hour. Underline that too, because I got, I got issues with that too. I got a lot of issues with this. In verse 7 he said, a woman from Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food, and the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. All right. Go back around that verse, like, one through five kind of deal. It says that he left Judea and departed to go to Galilee. And the, the scripture says that he had to pass through Samaria. Now, if you've ever seen a map of this, where he was going, I'm just going to make it really simple. Where he was going was here, or see, where he was was here, and where he was going was here, okay? In the middle of that was Samaria, okay? There's an alternate route that goes around this. And the reason we know it's an alternate route, because these guys hated each other. Jews and Samaritans didn't get along at all. There was a lot of racial conflict and a lot of just bad stuff. They just didn't like each other. So it was very common and very practical not to go through that. It was just, it was just like what they did. I mean, you would never like, nobody would have ever expected that Jesus would actually journey through Samaria. It just wasn't common. But yeah, the scripture says he had to go through Samaria. And I don't know if that's a big deal or not. But as I read that, I'm like, he didn't have to do that. He could have easily navigated around that. People did it all the time. But I think it's important to the story. He had to go through Samaria. And then it says, so he came to the town of Samaria called Sy uh, uh, Sychar. That's how I say it. Near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied, at, uh, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Wells were, were like, wells were sort of like the water cooler in the office, right? If you want to hear good gossip, if you want to meet people, if you want to talk to somebody, right? You go, you go to the water cooler, right? I don't know. Do they have water coolers anymore in offices? Anybody have, are you working in an office with a water cooler? You do? Not, does that still happen? They still do that? No, you don't want to say. <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, I don't know. I bring my own water. <laughs> But wells were like, they were like modern day water coolers. They were modern day water, water, literally water and holes that people would bring their flock and they'd bring their family and they would come the cool of the day and they'd gather water, they'd water their flocks, and then they would move on. This is, here, this, is what, this is what drives me crazy about this whole story is that, okay, number one, Jesus, you really didn't have to go through Samaria, but you did it anyway. All right, Jesus, you know good and well, you don't have to, you know good and well that you guys don't do that, but you did it. Scripture says you had to. Why'd you have to? And then Jesus, why did you sit at a well? Come on, really? I don't know about you, but when I'm tired, I don't want to be around people. I'm sorry if that offends you, but I really don't. I don't want to be around people. I just don't. I don't. How many of you agree with that? Please, somebody raise their hand. Thank you. All right, great. If I'm tired from a long journey, I'm usually cra crabby. Anything else? Um, I'm crabby. I'm not, I'm tired, right? I'm sort of snippy, right? Things like, like, you know, my son tells me a joke or my kid tells me a joke. My daughter tells me a joke and it just automatically sets me off for some reason. I'm like, that's not funny. And they're like, wow. Dad needs Jesus, you know? And so I'm thinking like, Jesus, why? You're, you're tired, you're weary, it says it's your way, and you go to a very public place. Why would you do that? Why would you go to a place where people gather? And then some of you would say, but hold on, wait, it was the sixth hour. I know, it's like the hottest part of the day. Why would you do that? But wait, nobody was there. Yes, but somebody shows up. Come with me, all right? Jesus stops at a well, very public water cooler. Everybody knows it's a well. They go there. He chose, he chose to stop at the sixth hour. Noon. I don't think he had to stop, to be honest with you. I don't think, I think as a Jew, he's like going through Samaria. He's like, you know what? I, a real, like a real Jew, I, I don't want to say it like that. But like a typical Jew would be like, I want to get through this place as fast as I can. I don't want to stop here. I don't want to run into any of these haters. I don't want to run into any of these people. I don't like these people. I just want to keep moving. And he stops. 
It's the hard, hottest part of the day. He's at a well alone. All of his disciples have gone. And here's on top of it. He has nothing to draw from. He's sitting at a well with no bucket. At the time that nobody's there, and if someone did show up, the people that show up at this time were not socially acceptable people, as we'll find out. The people that show up at noon at a well aren't people that um, are great stand-up people. They're people that come to the well because they've been excommunicated or disfellowshipped or shunned because they're sinners or they're unrighteous or unholy or untouchable or dirty. But Jesus strategically places himself in the midst of this situation at such a, a very strategic time. I think this is important for us to understand. It says, as we said before, Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Let me tell you something. Jesus is in the business of placing himself right in the middle of our mess. And we find when we read this story a little bit longer, we, we, we see that that's exactly what he was doing. See, I read this, and it is a total setup. I think, I, think, I think when the writer said like, Jesus had to go through some, I think, I think the, 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 the cliff note is he had to because there was something to do. There was someone to meet. There was something to say. There was someone who needed him. That's what he had to go through because technically, technically, he didn't have to do that. Matter of fact, it was very uncommon. I think it's important as we read this story that we see a woman who is broken come to this well at a very opportune time. We find out later why, right? She's coming at noon because, quite honestly, she's, she's a loose woman, man. She's got like four husbands or five guys she's sleeping with. I mean, like, whew. She's not allowed to come around other ladies. She's not allowed to come to the water hole when everybody was there. She's not allowed to do that no more. She crossed the line. Interesting thought. There was, I think there was something in her life that when she crossed that line, because I got to thinking like, man, five dudes, like, dang. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's a lot to keep up with. It just is. That's a lot. That's five guys. Like, why didn't she stop like at two and realize that that's enough to get her disfellowship? That's enough to like get her shunned. You might have a, like, a sort of a self-destructive personality sometimes that once you've crossed the line into sin, that there's a very small part of you that just says, well, it's over. I might as well just keep going. You ever been there? Don't go there. I have a feeling that's where her life went. I have a feeling that she's disfellowshipped. Her friends left her. Church said she can't come to church no more. The ladies started Facebooking about her online, started sending her hate mail, giving her dirty looks talking about her behind her back and she said you know what if this is if this is what it's going to be i might as well just keep going nobody cares about me anyway i might as well just keep living the way i'm living because i've already cashed out all my all my street cred all my friends side note jesus strategically places himself at the well at a time where only those disfellowshipped only those who have been shunned only those who have maybe have no other place to go come to the well I would tell you this that I think we should take some notes from that I think it's interesting as we reach out to people who are far from God that we have to think about things that we've never thought about I think I think if we continually do the things that we've always done we'll always be the type of people that we've always been like we got to think outside the box like, how many times did you, do you strategically place yourself in life so that broken people cross your path? You ever think about that? How many times do you strategically place yourself in life where broken people cross your path? Or are you so inebriated and so comfortable just not being around broken people? Because it is comfortable not to be around people that need anything, isn't it? It just is. And I think so many times if we don't strategically place ourselves in the path of broken people, then again, like I've said this before, we'll just become a little click. We'll look around, we'll all look the same, talk the same, act the same, dress the same, and that's when I mic drop and I leave. I've told you guys that we got to constantly push the barrier. We got to constantly strategically place ourselves in the path of people that desperately need God. If we don't, then why are we here? 
If we just keep doing the things that we've always done, then we'll keep getting the results that we've always gotten. We can't expect to get different results by doing the same thing. Where are those third places in your life? Where are those watering holes in your life? Where are the wells at work? Where are the wells at in your family? Where are those places where people gather and talk? Is it the school PTA? Is it somewhere in work? Is it on a smoke break? I used to work and I used to love hanging out at the smoke break. I just did. I loved it. It was great. And this is why. You know why I loved hanging out at smoke breaks? It's because people that didn't hang out at smoke breaks were just lame. Just lame. They were just, and you know what's weird is they always, they always were like, they were always dogging people that were having smoke breaks. And I was like, I really tired of that. I'm like, God, you guys are just, it's like you're glorifying that you're not having a smoke break. And I'm like, these guys are way more fun. And I would go out there and I would sit and uh, sit and they, you know, they'd always dare me to smoke a cigarette. And I'm like, well, I'm not smoking a cigarette. But you got a cigar? No, I'm just kidding. Um, but here's the thing. <laughs> Don't email me. Good night. <laughs> here's the thing, though. It's like sometimes I think there are strategic places that we pass over all the time. Mine, where, where I saw people that desperately needed Jesus, where I worked was, was during a smoke break at a couple of businesses that I worked at. And so I would just go and I would hang out and, you know, just talk. And I'm not talking about like just, hey, do you know Jesus? I don't, I'm not, I'm not, don't, I say this all, don't be weird. Please. They already think you're weird. Don't be weird. Be a friend. Be a friend. Hang out in places where broken people hang out and, and start to get to know them. Like how many broken people are in your life that you know them? You know their name. You know their middle name. You know how many kids they have. Like do you ever think about that? Like do you know their kids by name? You ever been to one of their ball games? You ever hung out with them? See, be purposeful and deliberate. Don't just float through this life like, like there's nothing there. Or just like you're just buying your time. In verse 7, it says, A woman from Samaria came in to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. And this is, this, is, this is where everything crosses the line. This is where people are reading this for the first time, Jews, and they're going, What? Because not only was it socially unacceptable for Jews and Samaritans to hang out together, but it was really socially unacceptable for men and women to talk in a public place like that. He's not married to her. He don't know her. Man, he, Jesus crossed all kind of lines. And that's why I like him. This woman sees Jesus. She comes to the well, and before she can say anything, Jesus looks at her and says, Give me a drink. See, this is why I believe Jesus was sitting at the well at noon. This is why I believe Jesus strategically went through Samaria rather than going around it, is to have this conversation with this woman who'd been shunned from the community, who'd been deemed unholy and unfit, whose lifestyle had been keeping her outside of the fellowship. Have you ever felt like that? Ever felt disfellowship from a group, right? We have a huge complex with this, don't we? Get into a group chat on Facebook, right? How many of you ever got trapped in one of those? What's the last thing you want to do? Leave the group, right? Because if you leave the group, how do you feel? You feel like you have abandoned them, right? And you feel, I don't know about you, maybe I'm super narcissistic, but I feel like if I leave this group, they, are, they will sit in a corner and go, I cannot believe he left the group. Let's keep him out. <laughs> We have issues with this. We have issues with, with, with just unhealthy fears. We always want to be included. We always want to be a part. When, and, and, and the times that we're not, we feel like abandoned, right? They have a, they have a, what was it, FOMO, right? FOMO, fear of missing out. It's not what you thought it was. FOMO, fear of missing out. It's a real thing. Google it. It's a real thing. Fear of missing out. You know what? Often what we do is we take the FOMO mentality and instead of just living our life, we operate in this fear of I got to be a part of everything because I don't want to be disfellowshipped. But imagine being disfellowshipped and not having a choice. You know, what was this woman thinking? She sees Jesus. She draws near to Jesus. I can't even believe she kept going. I would have thought she'd seen him from afar. I think it's just a sign of how much she really has sort of thrown her hands up. I guess my big point today is this, is that 
the simplistic thing is that we don't need anything more than Jesus in our lives, but we need more of Jesus in every part of our lives. I think so many times we waste our time trying to find the Holy Grail of Christianity and Jesus is sitting there the whole time at the well going, hey, I'm here. See, Jesus knows knows what he's doing with this woman. He knows he's going to spark up a conversation. This thing's been set up from the beginning. I would tell it all of us that I think it's encouraging to look at what Jesus did purposefully. He came with no bucket. Sort of weird to be at a well with no bucket, right? It's like going to water cooler with no cup, right? Unless you're one of those guys that put their head under that thing, but it is. It's sort of weird, right? It's like, it's like going to the mechanic shop with no car. I mean, it's like there's things you bring to a well and one of them is a bucket and Jesus deliberately has no bucket. He deliberately sits there. He deliberately goes through Samaria. He deliberately has a conversation with this woman. And when I read this, when I was reading this, I thought, man, how many times do I, do I position myself at watering holes, but I, 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 I sort of bring my bucket. In other words, it's like this. I used to, I used to do cabinetry and I used to put headphones in all the time, right? How, how many of you work with music? You work with music in your ears, right? It's sort of nice. I like it. I had somebody challenge me this, uh, in this one time. They said, wait, they go, how many people do you work with? And I said, well, I work with about 30 or 40 people. He said, how many people, how many of those people know Jesus? And I'm like, I don't know, like two, <laughs> you know? And they're like, so what is your work day? Like I said, well, I go, I go to my station and, and I put my headphones in and, and I just jam out and work, you know? And they're like, well, do you have any, do you ever have any God conversations while you're in, while you're in the shop working? And I'm like, no, not really. Everybody sort of does his own thing. And everybody's pretty much got headphones in and we just jam out and work. And he goes, you know what? I want to challenge you. Why don't you go to work tomorrow and don't, don't wear your headphones? And I said, well, that's blasphemous. <laughs> I'm going to wear my headphones. And he goes, no, here, you ever thought about this? You ever thought that maybe nobody's having a conversation with you because you have your headphones in? You ever thought about maybe nobody's approaching you or maybe the opportunity hasn't arise because you don't look available. You look like you got it all figured out. You look like you're just doing your thing and nobody wants to bother you. I think if Jesus had a bucket, he would have never been able to say, give me a drink, right? I think Jesus came deliberately without a bucket. He came deliberately with a gap and a void so that he could spark up a conversation with someone and then start getting to the end of the story. How many times have we just sort of done our thing by ourselves and not leave a gap to invite somebody else in so that we can share the gospel with them. Think about this, guys. How many times have you had to work on something, right? You can do it, okay? I'm not telling you you can't do it, but you can do it. You have all the means and all the know-how, all the tools, all the stuff, right? And you just do it. How about this? What if, guys, what if instead of working on something by yourself, what if you just invited somebody along for the journey who didn't know anything about anything you're doing, you just invite them to your house to help you out so that maybe you can have a conversation with them? You ever thought about that? Isn't that such a strategic move towards mission? Isn't that such a strategic move towards sharing the gospel with people? I find that, I find that awesome. I mean, I just love it. I mean, I've, I've helped some of you guys out in your businesses. I don't know, I don't know anything what you guys do. Nothing. And I, f I find it so cool that you invite me in and, and, and you allow me to help you, allow me to get in that space, even though I feel like it's just total spaz because I don't know anything. But you allow me into that space and you teach me. Wouldn't it be great as a missional move towards people that don't know Jesus is maybe instead of splitting wood by yourself, maybe instead of splitting wood by yourself, because you can do it, maybe inviting someone else to do that with you. Maybe instead of working on that snowmobile by yourself, maybe inviting someone else to do it with you. Wouldn't that be awesome? I don't know how that relates to ladies. I don't know. What, um, and, huh? Chocolate and coffee. Right. Instead of having chocolate and coffee by yourself. Have that. No. But in every form and fashion, right? Ladies, here's a, here, here's a great thing. And, I, and, and actually, we do, we've done this, and I've had people do this with me, is, you know, sometimes being a disciple and living on mission is just inviting someone else to go along the journey with you. What are the things you do every day? Go to the grocery store? Go get gas? Go pick up kids? That's a, you know what? Picking up kids at the, at the school, that's a great mission field. You ever just get there early? Strike up a conversation with somebody? Maybe park close to them? Not freaky close, but just close to them? And just so you can see them? See, when I see this story of Jesus going to the well, I see, a, I see just a total setup. Jesus knew what he was doing. And I'm wondering if he's trying to communicate to his readers... Not only are there broken people in the world, but there are also people that know Jesus, know the life that he gives, and can strategically place themselves in the midst of those people 
See, Jesus invites people to come with him. He invites the rich, he invites the poor, the educated, and the simple. Jesus creatively communicates the gospel everywhere he goes. You ever see this? He creatively communicates the gospel. He uses farming, he uses the law. It depends on who he's talking to, right? And he just, he just uses those examples to reach people. How many of you have ever seen the Truman Show? You ever seen the Truman Show? Yeah? Awesome. I find it interesting that in the Truman Show that, you know, everything is run, Jim Carrey is the main character, and everything around him, right, is being run by this one guy, right? And everything else is make-believe. And Jim Carrey doesn't know it, but he's living in a world where everything is sort of ordained and sort of um, predestined, if you will, to work in his sort of favor. I mean, things just sort of happen, and they negotiate the atmosphere and the climate and the weather and his job and everything, right? Wouldn't it be an interesting thought to think this, that maybe as we're living on this earth, that maybe God is in complete control, Right? And he's actually orchestrating, ordaining, and predestined things to happen in your life so that you can share the gospel with people. Maybe we're Jim Carrey. Maybe God is the one, right, who has everything under control, and maybe he is working out his will to make his name great. Maybe he's ordering our steps. Proverbs 16, 9, right? The Lord established the steps of man. I'll just conclude with this. As I look at this passage, and it's, it's longer than this. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll jump into it tomorrow, too, or next week. But um, I don't want us to ever forget that Jesus associates with people who are probably, well, who aren't like him. Like Jesus is in the business of setting himself in the middle of depravity and brokenness. And why? Why is he doing that? Like this is the simplicity of the gospel. Is why does Jesus constantly position himself in the middle of depravity and brokenness? He's God. He doesn't really have to do that. But he does that because he loves people. He loves them. See, don't overcomplicate it. He loves them. We should love people. The broken. We should love those who are far from God. We shouldn't shun them because of their history. We shouldn't shun them because of what they've done. We shouldn't not go to them because they're broken or dirty or not like us. If anything, that should draw us even more towards them. I think this is why when we read the scripture about Matthew, right? Matthew 9, 9, I think it's in. He's, when they, Jesus called Matthew and he told the Pharisees, he's like, listen, it's not the sick who need the doctor. It's not the, the well that need the doctor. It's the sick. It's not those who think they got it figured out. It's those that have no clue. See, to the broken, Jesus is at the well. To the broken, Jesus is at the well. And he's there to meet with us. He's there to give us life. He's there to talk, to communicate his goodness to us, to love us. You ever felt not worthy of God's love? You ever been there? You ever just messed up really bad and you just feel like, that's it, it's over, God hates me. We've said this before, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more and there's nothing you've done that God would love you less. Do you really believe that? Can you stand with me real quick and we'll be done. And this would be my hope. See, when I read this story about this woman, here's my thing is that I think it's, I think it's easy to make it all about the woman at the well, right? But I, I think for me, the underlying thing is that Jesus is there and he's ready to talk. He strategically alters his route to be in a place where, I mean, a lot of his friends would say you shouldn't be there to talk to people that a lot of his friends would say you shouldn't talk to her. And I would just dare to say that there are some of us in this room that feel a lot like the woman, right? Maybe you're a guy and you just feel like you just can't get it right. <laughs> and you just keep trying and trying and just, it's like, you just know you're going to fail, right? You're going to fail at your job. You're going to fail your wife. You're going to fail your kids. You're going to fail your family. You just can't, you just can't get it right. And then there's probably some ladies in here where you feel like, you know what? I'm probably never going to be in a healthy relationship. I'm probably never going to have someone who can love me. I'm probably never going to have a bright future because of X, Y, Z in your past. And, 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 and all I want to do is encourage you to just go to Jesus. <laughs> because here's the thing is, is there's not a good enough sermon I can preach to get you to the place where 
you're made whole. I mean, Jesus is the one that makes people whole. And so the woman at the well, she sees Jesus, and I just picture this. She sees this man sitting by the well, and she's sort of bewildered, right? And as she walks closer, she's hesitant. She knows that she probably can't have a, she can't have a conversation with this guy. And from a distance, he looks like a Jew. And that just, uh, that's a whole nother issue. All of a sudden, all of her anxiety rises to the top because she wonders, does this guy know my story? Is he local? Has he heard about me? She hesitates, hesitates, stops, looks, stops, looks, stops, looks. And then Jesus sees her. Maybe she's not even at the well yet, but they meet eyes. She sees Jesus. She sees that he's sort of not threatening, just looks tired. And maybe she can sneak a pitcher of water out of the well without being disruptive. She comes closer, and the most unthinkable thing happens at the un- most thinkable time. Jesus speaks to her and invites her into a conversation. And from that point on, her, sto- her story changes. It changes. So this is what I want to tell you. Today, Jesus is at the well. Some of us need rest. Some of us need forgiveness. Some of us need healing. Some of us need Jesus to do something with our brokenness and our shame. And I'll tell you this, that he's there ready to have a conversation with you. All you have to do, James 4 is draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. So as we pray today, this would be my hope, is that you would lean towards the well. That you would continue to walk towards the well where Jesus is, ready to heal and forgive, give mercy. But wait, I've already prayed for forgiveness, and and I feel like I'm just going to do it again. You know what? He doesn't run out, man. He doesn't run out. See, Jesus Jesus is a well that never runs dry. And tons of forgiveness, tons of mercy, tons of healing, tons of love. So can we do this today as we bow our heads and as we pray? Can we just ask God to be that for us? God, we thank you that you're at the well today. And I don't know. I know my own life, God. You know my struggles and my my hang-ups and just my stuff. And you see my mess and my depravity. And God, I thank you that you don't run from us, but that you run to us. God, I thank you that even at the well, when we see you there, we hesitate because, quite honestly, we feel really unholy. It's a tough thing, God, for us to grasp that you would be willing to have a conversation with us. Because for all we've done and for all we've probably going to do in our lives, it just doesn't look super holy. Remind us that it's not our holiness. Remind us that it's not our salvation. Remind us that it's not our sacrifice, but it's you. That we're holy because you're holy that we've been made righteous through your son, Jesus. That we have the easy part, that the heavy lifting has been done for us, that we can now sit and rest in the presence of the Father. Lord, we pray that you would, again, take our shame and take our hurt and take our brokenness. We lay it down at the foot of the cross, a place where things die. And we ask, Lord, that you would bring us life as we lay those things down. Help us to be brave. I believe there's probably some of us in this room that have never walked towards you. They've never leaned in your direction, and it's, it's nerve-wracking, and sometimes it can be scary. So, God, I pray that you would make us brave. And in our time and our weakness and our shame and our sin, that we would run to you, that we wouldn't just give in to depravity and to weakness and go down in flames, but, God, that we would run to you. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with this living water that you speak of and make us new. I just want to pause. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I just give a couple of seconds. Just a pause in quietness and stillness. If you want to pray, you can pray. If you want to just listen, you can listen. Let's just pause for a second. us. Thank you for walking to us.
thank you for being at the well. Help us this week, Lord, to place ourselves at the watering holes in our community. Help us to strategically place ourselves in the midst of those who are broken like us, who need Jesus like us. Give us bravery and courage to speak those words of life. Help us, Lord, to build relationships with those who are far from you. Lord, help us to help us to help you <laughs> in your mission to seek and to save the lost, to build your kingdom and not ours. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Awesome. Hey, one of the things that we say all the time is that no one should do life alone. Sometimes in brokenness, the best thing, we, the one thing we want to do is not the best thing. Is we want to just be by ourselves, right? Just want to go sit in the corner. I want to turn the lights off, and I just want to, like, just die slowly, right? And I'll tell you, I've never made a great decision by myself, ever, ever. And... Um, our big thing is don't do life alone. We, we have community groups that happen in the week. These are like these are like the bloodline of who we are. It's doing life with other people, being able to ask questions about God, be, ask questions about your faith, being able to just learn from people who have been down the road, being able to share your story with people and hear other people's story and build relationships with people. So we have communities all this week. We got valor for men. If you're a man, you just want to be around some men, it's going to happen Tuesday night. We got uh, Tammy and Matt's community happening right after this. It was at 1230 or something like that. 1230, they share a meal. It's at Element Main Street. Every community group shares a meal. Um, and it's just part of what we are. So uh, we encourage you to get involved in the community group, grab it in the loop, look on the back, um, and hook up with somebody. Right? Amen? Hey, if you need anything, we'll, uh, me and my wife will be up here for a little bit. If you need prayer or something like that, come on up here. We'll love to pray for you. Other than that, have a great day. Stay dry. Stay warm. And we'll see you in community this week. God bless. Oh, hey, did you guys hear that we won the uh, service uh, organization of the year. Isn't that great? Hey, great job. Great job, Element Church. Proud of you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for leading that. God bless. Have a great afternoon.